Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here today. This is Michael Sandler. I'm going to be going over a uh, presentation with you. We call it Fall in Love with Winter Running. I say we because I have uh, Jessica, my wife and co-author, co-founder and co-everything. She is on the line with me live from uh, New York City area. And uh, what she's going to do is she's going to be a uh, co-moderator here. So if you have any questions, you send them in and she'll get your questions and uh, interject when it's right to get those questions into me. So uh, why don't we jump right into things. We have a very special presentation for you here. Um, this may be one of the most, if not the most comprehensive uh, presentation on uh, winter running out there. I think you're going to love it. So a little background on me. I am the uh, best-selling co-author of Barefoot Running and Barefoot White Walking, along with Jessica Lee. Uh, we wrote the number one selling exercise and fitness book on Kindle that stayed that way for nine months running. We um, I are co-founders of the Mindful Academy and co-creators of the Mindful Running Training Program, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about later on as we go along. Personally, I've trained at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. I've been a coach and professional athlete for well over 20 years, held clinic and workshops for over 10,000 runners worldwide, and uh, I think it is no, <laughs> no uh, small exaggeration to say I live to run. Um, I am truly a running addict, and uh, in the wintertime when I get the chance, I also love to snowshoe preferably at high altitude up above 10 or 11,000 feet where there are no trees around and just out in wide open spaces. So I want to talk about uh, what season, uh, pop quiz here, <laughs> what season is the easiest to make the biggest gains? And you may be thinking it's springtime because it's getting warm out, it's summertime, everything's nice and loose, but you probably already know the answer to this. Um, it is uh, the winter time, and it turns out the winter time is really the best time to turn. <laughs> what we have here is a uh, a beat up VW bus into a shiny red Sportster or Speedster Porsche with nice white walls. Come spring, and uh, yeah, it's winter time. There's some great reasons for that, and most importantly, it's because we're not running as much. It turns out that's actually the best thing in the world for building a strong foundation for the rest of the year. Because you're running less, because it's cold outside, we get into the gym, we're doing our strength training, we're working on form, we're working on new breathing techniques, on better running rhythms, we're doing visualization work, and perhaps most importantly is we're allowing those nagging injuries to heal or for the body to cool off and calm down. Because it is so common that we go through our entire running season and we have a little ache or pain in the ankle, a little problem going on in the knee, maybe there's a calf that won't loosen up on it, and we never give it a chance to rest and recover. And the winter time is the perfect opportunity to do just that. So here's a little bit about what we're going to cover in this workshop. And uh, <laughs> by no small stretch, when I say it's comprehensive, it really is. First, we're going to go over the challenges, advantages of wintertime. We're going to go over staying safe outdoors and indoors. We're going to talk about, about the best ways to build strength, flexibility, and a strong core. We're going to look at using sitting, being in this chair or stool here to your advantage. We're going to talk about simulated high altitude training and how to use breath work to help raise your VO2 max without <laughs> working on the training aspect, but just through the breath alone. We're gonna talk about holiday diet considerations, how to keep your weight down as those sweets are up. <laughs> We're gonna talk about how to keep you from getting sick through the holidays, how mindful running can help you in the winter time, and really a winter attitude for success because that attitude and the cold and the time that you're stuck indoors and that dreary weather can make a world of difference. We're gonna have a Q&A session where we're gonna go over anything that you wanna cover. And as a bonus, at the very end, we're gonna go over what I call snow to call or safe ways to get into barefoot running in the cold and snow. And that's for our uh, barefoot audience as well. You don't need to do this, of course, uh, but for the barefoot runners out there, it could be a little bit of fun. And uh, 
I'm addicted to that when I get the chance as well, particularly spring snows and uh, fall snows, which don't really have that hardened cold that you get in the dead of winter. So just what is it that makes winter so challenging? And really what that is, is it's not so much the weather or the cold, it's the change in weather and it's the change in gear and the change in workouts. Our bodies love change. They're able to adapt with change, but they like change in small incremental doses. The problem is that winter tends to come in with a roar. One day you're running along, it's still nice and warm outside, it's in the 50s and 60s, you're feeling great, boom. <laughs> the winds come through, the next day it's in the 30s, you've got on your winter running shoes, you've got on your tights, you've got on all these extra layers, and that's when we tend to get into trouble because we tend to say, take our mileage we were doing before, we carry that same mileage over with the new gear on, with the different workouts we're doing to stay warm, uh, with our different footwear on, and we tend to get ourselves into a bit of trouble. In addition to that, we can get the winter blues, and that means first off, we tend to get sedentary. We want to slow down. It's the natural reaction of the body of all animals out there to want to hibernate. Now, it's not a problem to wind down a little bit, but when we wind down too much, the body works on the use it or lose it principle, and it flips the off switch, which means not only does our fitness go down, but our flexibility goes down, our strength goes down, and our focus, our mental muscle goes down, and that's really the hardest one to get back come January 1st or come springtime. In addition to us flipping the off switch on our fitness, at the same time we're flipping the on switch for wanting to store or put on the calories. Particularly, this is the holiday season. This is when we're given the cakes, we're given the treats, we're given all that sweet stuff, and our body wants to pack on the pounds to get us through the wintertime. It doesn't realize that this is not 100,000 or a million years ago and that there's food aplenty. It thinks, I need to put on all the weight I can, all the extra calories I can, because I don't know when I'm going to get a next meal. So that uh, gaining, getting sedentary and gaining weight, that's a double whammy that we have to watch out for. But there are also some huge advantages of winter time. And uh, first and foremost is it's colder and there's less daylight, which means chances are we're going to want to do our workouts indoors. That's great. This is when we're going to hit the gym. This is when we're going to cross train. This is when we're going to do those activities to build the muscle strong and more symmetrical for the season to come. Things that, uh, let's be honest, if it was nice outside and you had a choice between being in the gym and being out on the trails, chances are you're going to be out on the trails. That doesn't help you build the foundation strong, particularly if you have a nagging injury. It just perpetuates it. So now we're kind of forced indoors, and that's a good thing. So it's going to help you get injury-free, stronger, better balanced. You also don't need to worry about speed this time of the year unless you've got an indoor track season. That's great. It also allows us to back things off and get to work on recovery and foundation building. On top of that, the whole rest of the world, all of the animal kingdom, works on cycles. A cycle, 24-hour cycle, cycle of the seasons, a cycle of the year. Which means that if you back down this time of the year, when the rest of the world is going quiet, when the rest of the world is recovering, then boom, come springtime, you can really take off. And Myself, I didn't believe this for a long time. In fact, my first coach that I had, I told her she was nuts when she said I had to back down and <laughs> back off and take time off in the fall and winter time. And I thought she was nuts. She was right. <laughs> because springtime, I was flying, I was winning races, I was on top of my game. And by summertime, I was cooked. But if we use this time to set ourselves up for the greatest season ever, then once springtime comes around, once things are starting to sprout and starting to grow, so are we. So let's talk about staying safe outdoor in the wintertime. Now, you've probably seen images, you will throughout this live show, of me running barefoot in the snow and running in the cold. I absolutely love it. I'm addicted to it, particularly the first few snows of the year. But if you're like me, you have to be wary of over exuberance. This means the first snows come, the change in weather, you want to get out and play. 
Maybe you even like the thrill, the excitement, the challenge of it all. The trick with it is, let's say you were doing 10 miles a day before the cold weather hit, and now you want to continue that same 10 miles a day. You're just out there having fun. Well, we need to take in account a few different things. First off, you're breathing colder air. So that's going to be harder on the lungs. That naturally means we're going to need to back things down. Second, you've got different gear on, which means your stride is going to change. We need to back things down. Third, you're going to have different clothing on, which is going to bind you up and make your body work differently. Again, we're going to need to change things or slow down things, or you can quickly run into an overuse injury. So first, let's talk a little bit about the breath here. In the winter time, we can adapt to it. We can really run well in the cold, but at first, it's a tremendous shock to our lungs. So if you don't want to end up with a cold, bronchitis, or pneumonia, we need to bring in heated or warmed air into our lungs. The first and best way to do that is nose breathing, and we're going to talk to you more about that in just a little bit. But chances are you're not trained well enough to be able to nose breathe at speed yet. That means wearing things like, well, I always get this word wrong, I apologize in advance, a balaclava or a handkerchief over your mouth or some sort of a ski mask or face mask so that the air you breathe in is protected. It gets just a little bit of warmth before you get it into your lungs. This helps keep the lungs safe. In addition, you want to back down the pace a little bit so that you're not breathing in that really cold air at speed, which can actually scar and do damage to your lung cells, to your alveoli, taking time to repair. So if you've ever done a, a fall or winter run and you get back and you're coughing a little bit and your hung, lungs hurt a little bit, you've actually damaged and frozen some of those cells or exploded some of the capillaries beyond the cells. We don't want to do that. <laughs> so it means starting slow. Next, it means teaching the body how to warm itself up for the cold. Now, there's some Arctic runners out there. They've set world records trained under uh, Dr. Timothy Noakes, author of The Lore of Running, for uh, doing some amazing cold weather feats, actually cold weather uh, swimming in the Arctic, not running in the Arctic. And what they found is when they started doing breathing exercises and visualization exercises, they could actually raise their body temperature before with by several degrees before they even got in the water. And that's important that we start learning how to do that, not obviously for the water, but for the cold weather, so we can keep our core temperature high. Now, there's a great, easy visualization that you can do. You'll see a picture of me in an upcoming slide. I'm beet red running in the snow. And what I'm doing is I'm using this visualization so that when snow gets on me, it actually melts. It kind of goes off of steam because my body has gotten so hot. And that is to picture in your core, in your belly, the flame of a hot air balloon. Every time that you take a breath, either inhale or exhale, whichever you prefer, I prefer it on the exhalation, imagine that you're pulling on the, uh, the cord that lights the flame to your hot air balloon. So you exhale, you picture your whole body growing red, getting hotter, 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 and you take a nice gentle inhale, then you exhale, and you picture it getting hotter still. And you can actually raise your body temperature and get yourself beet red before you even head out. Then remember this trick so when you're out there, if you start to get cold, you can put that flame on high. Next, let's talk about layering for the cold. And really, the enemy in the cold is not the temperature, it's the moisture. Moisture is the enemy. So the most important thing that we want to do is layer up for the wintertime. This means getting a first layer, the layer that's closest to your skin, that is great wicking material that draws like a candle draws moisture away from your skin now there's some great uh, synthetics out there some polypropylene materials that do a good job i prefer things like wool natural products advantage of wool well first off it's not going to smell or stink it's hypoallergenic it's going to do a much better job for you there over the long run and secondly if you accidentally do get wet Wool holds most of your heat when it's wet, and the uh, synthetic materials 
you freeze. <laughs> so get like a layer of smart wool or something like that next to your skin. You're going to do much better. On top of that, have layer after layer of removable clothing, easily removable clothing with preferably zippers, but you could also use snaps so you can easily remove, add, or adjust on the go. It is so important that you're able to adjust because the most important thing is we don't want you getting too warm. If you get too warm in winter running, you sweat. And if you sweat, you get wet. And if you get wet, then sooner or later, you're going to get chilled and you're going to get into trouble. So I recommend the many layers and being able to unzip, even remove if you want. I like carrying a very light pack with me that I can stuff clothing into and take it in or out as necessary. Now let's talk about footwear, and footwear is a key one because I'm a member of the club that you never want to join, and that is the Black Toe Club. And no, those black toes didn't come from running barefoot. I've actually never run into a cold weather problem going barefoot. Those came from a new pair of winter running shoes. I got a nice new pair of shoes, got them pretty snug, got my uh, synthetic socks in there, went out for this beautiful run by uh, NCAR in uh, Boulder, Colorado, up in the, the foothills, was feeling great, and then something strange started to happen. Uh, my stride seemed to be a little bit off, and I couldn't tell what was going on, and I tried to check in with my body. Everything felt fine. Then the stride was a little bit more off, and then suddenly it turned into a limp. I still didn't know what was going on, but I'm like, uh-oh. I better get back to the car, and I better get back to the car fast. And so I'm doing kind of a mad dash back to the car. I get to the car, don't notice what's going on, but I'm limping more. I take off my shoes, and then I'm like, oh, crap. I had toes that were turning black on me. Now, black is the step before you lose toes. It's a really, really big deal. And so I'm basically burning rubber in the snow. It's a paradox, but I was doing the best I could to get myself home, get myself into a hot tub, and try to warm those things up as fast as I could. Now, we'll talk about that more in a second, but what happened here in post-mortem? Well, what happened is the shoes were good and snug. I wanted them snug so that there was no extra space in there for cold air to get in. That was the reverse of what I wanted. What I actually wanted was a little extra space in my shoes to trap warm air, and so that I could use a nice thick sock, preferably again a wool sock, to trap warm air. I was using also a synthetic sock, but I was running in conditions that had some snow. So the snow was getting, I didn't have gaiters on, which blocks my ankle from snow. So snow was getting to my socks, it was drawing it down to my toes, and then the socks were at, acting as a refrigerator rather than a heater. On top of that, I wore a stiff-soled shoe. If you have the opportunity to wear something like a flexible moccasin in the wintertime, I highly recommend it. The more flexibility that you have for your feet to move, the more blood flow they're going to get down there, the more your capillaries are going to be engaged in the process rather than constricted, and the more your muscles have to work. The more your muscles of your feet have to work, the more they require blood flow, the more the body brings in blood flow. Rather than in a stiff shoe where the toes and feet don't have to work, your body blood shunts or takes warm blood away from your feet and puts it to other parts of the body that need it more. Learned an important lesson there. Fortunately, it was able to catch my toes in time, uh, though I had damage in several of the toes for at least a year or two to come. Now, I want to jump ahead to frostbite since we're on the topic here. The general rule with frostbite is freeze fast, cool fast. Freeze slow, cool slow. If you're going out for a run and you freeze something, that's a fast freezing, even if it's a two or three hour run. Get back, get it under warm or slightly hot water right away. Be careful of really hot water. The problem isn't the damage done by the hot water. That's a uh, fallacy. In fact, running it under cold water is not necessary at all. That's a fallacy. The trick is if things are frozen, you can't feel how hot it is, and you could actually start immersing your fingers or toes in scalding water without realizing it. That's a real danger. But now, if you are out for days, you're on an uh, Everest expedition, something like that, that's where you would want to thaw things slowly because those froze slowly. But that's not regular conditions are not what's really going on when we're doing some running training and we freeze things really fast. You want to thaw them fast, fast. In wintertime, you can replace duration with intensity to a certain degree. So you're going out for, let's say it's supposed to be about a 45-minute run. 
It is brutally cold out. The wind is really going. How about going out at a 20 or 25 minute run at a little bit brisker of a pace to help yourself keep and stay warm? As long as you're protecting your lungs, that's not a problem. However, the reverse of that, if you were supposed to go out for interval training, and I don't know why you'd be doing interval training in the middle of the winter, but if that's on your training plan to be doing interval training and it's really cold out, Let's back that off or figure out something you can do so that we're not frying your lungs. Because if we don't need to expose yourself to that much cold air, the faster you breathe, the more we're going to cool off your lungs, the more time that's going to be spent with cold air exchanging over the alveoli. Anytime we can avoid that exposure, the healthier it's going to be for you. Only time that you need to do this, well, if you're a cross-country ski racer, if you're a snowshoe racer, if you have winter events, then you may not be able to back off that intensity. Last thing is have a plan for safety. This means be thinking about when am I going to need to turn for home. Always follow what I call the two-question rule. The first time you're in the cold and you hear, hmm, maybe I should turn around, make mental note of it. The second time you hear, maybe I should flip it around, don't even ask yourself the question, and head for home. And then think of your course in advance. You always want to do, at minimum, an out and back loop when you're going for a run in the wintertime, or even better, what I call a circle hub or a pizza run. And the pizza run is you basically you go out and run slices. Go out, come back, that's one slice. Go out, come back, that's another slice. Constantly checking in with your home base so that if your body temperature starts to drop, if your toes start to get cold, you're always really close to home so you don't have to go that extra mile or two before you start to warm things up. So always have a safety plan in place. That safety plan could even be hopping on the bus if you need to get home, but have something in place. Now let's talk about indoor safety and specifically on the treadmill, which <laughs> I, I love treadmills. I've also hurt myself on treadmills several times. They are a confounded at times evil, evil, evil device. <laughs> and that is because a treadmill is a perfectly flat surface. And nowhere in nature except maybe a frozen lake or maybe the, the salt flats and we typically don't run across the salt flats, although it's probably pretty fun. Uh, big bike ridden across it. That was a lot of fun. But we don't have these perfectly flat surfaces, which means that you get the identical stride step after step, mile after mile, which means that your muscles work in exactly the same way way step after step. The advantage of being on uneven surfaces is that one step you land this way, the next step you land that way, then over here, then over there. You're constantly working some muscles while you allow others to rest and recover. That's the natural way of being outdoors. That doesn't work on a treadmill, so it's easy to get an overuse injury. In addition, Einstein wasn't quite <laughs> right when it comes to a treadmill. A surface coming to you is different than you going to a surface because when your foot tries to meet up with the treadmill, it tries to do a braking action. It wants to slow down to get that secure surface underneath and that increases the impact transient, the shock wave that's sent up through your body. This again means we need to slow down on the treadmill and do less in the beginning rather than more. So let's talk about transitioning to a treadmill. Now, most indoor activities, I recommend starting with every other day to begin. Use the muscles one day, break them down, allow them to recover the next day, go again, allow them to recover the next day. With a treadmill, I highly recommend once every third day, at least for the first two weeks. Now, I know for some people that may be like, wow, I'm going to radically come back, cut back my mileage, my body's not going to take to that, I'm not going to be all right. Well, don't panic. The body will not detrain that fast. You're still doing activity. If you need to, get a two out of three days. Get that second day of a walk in there rather than a run, but a run once every three days if possible for your first two weeks. Additionally, back off the mileage, back off the intensity, and now let's talk about uh, really changing up the gain or changing how you run on the treadmill. The best, safest way, and actually the most fun way that you can do this, is use the hills. 
chances are the treadmill goes up to 12, 14, even 15%. So what you want to do is like warm up by increasing inclination, increasing, get all the way up to 10 or 15 degrees. Then as you back it down, start to pick back up the speed and then start alternating it. Do one minute at 15%, one minute at 10%, one minute at 12%, another minute at 7%. Keep alternating back and forth as you increase and lower the speed as well. What this is going to do is it's going to make you land a little bit differently for each minute that you change your pace or change your inclination. Basically, finding ways to trick yourself, trick your body into the treadmill without the potential for overuse injury. Now, a really fun workout that you can do, I cannot have alluded to it a minute ago, is to bump up the inclination when you start, get it all the way to 15 degrees, and then for each degree that you go down, increase the miles per hour, maybe a tenth of a mile per hour, maybe two tenths, maybe even half a mile per hour, until you get down to zero degrees and you are absolutely flying. It feels so much fun because here you were running up a wall, huffing and puffing, and now you've got no wall. You actually feel like you're sprinting downhills. So it's just a really fun workout. On top of that, you can do the uh, random programs on there. Anything you can do that keeps changing up the hill so that it keeps changing your stride. And then on a treadmill, it's a perfect time to work on form. Work on a nice short stride, work on fast leg turnover, work on kicking that heel up high, bringing that knee up high, hot coals, picking the up feet up really fast. These are things we go over in our mindful running training program and all of our other products as well. Focus on form on the treadmill. After all, what else do you have to do? Watch the TV? Much better to focus on your form so you come out in springtime with a beautiful, clean form. So there are so many machines at the gym other than treadmill. How do you know which one to choose and uh, why to choose these ones? Well, I say overall, almost all, keyword is almost all of the machines are worth trying and figuring out which ones you like best. You can use an elliptical. Just be careful if it's one that hyperextends your legs. That's to be one thing to be wary of. You can use a stair stepper. I recommend doing high repetitions and using the one that have pedals rather than have an escalator. I don't see any reason to worry about tripping on an escalator <laughs> while you're at the gym. So do one that has the fast steps that you can do over the escalator on it. I actually have a really fun workout that I like doing on a stair stepper. And this isn't exactly building into it slowly. It's a bit challenging, but it's a fun way to get into it, which is to do one minute at a very high speed because this is focuses on fast leg turnover, something that you really want to get for running. And then you do one minute really slow, holding on to the sides, but keeping yourself nice and erect. And then go a minute again at a higher intensity as well. You start out with this one with only five to 10 minutes and build up. We're not working so much on uh, extremely hard cardiovascular workout here as we are getting the core and legs engaged to hold you upright when your legs are moving so quickly. This is something that will tremendously benefit you when you're running on the roads later in the year. Things you can also do are like the Versa Climber. You'll see that on the uh, center of your slideshow there. Uh, that's one of the oldies, but goodies out there. That's the one that uh, uh, Drago used in uh, Rocky IV, I believe it is, the Russian gentleman. And uh, that's a really fun one for running uphill really, really fast. And then also look at alternative machines such as rowing machines. And uh, you can even look at cross-country ski machines. I'm a big fan of a rowing machine. If we keep our back nice and flat, we pivot through the waist, we pull things in nice and high to the chest, and we're not horking with our back, but doing a nice, smooth, steady movement. That's the key there. In fact, the key with all of these machines really is to be able to use good running form. So what does it mean for good running form on the machine? It means you want to be tall on every machine that you do. You want to imagine a silvery string 
pulling yourself nice and tall to the sky. You want to have your core engaged or your belly button snapped into your spine. You want to stay nice and upright, never leaning forward or hunching forward at the waist. The worst thing that you can do is grab onto the rails and lean forward like this because that's a lower back injury in the making. So stay nice and tall without curling forward like that and then run proud with your chest and chin to the sky moving forward picture yourself as a kenyan an elite level athlete elite level runner just flying along no matter what the motion is that you're doing now some of the machines promote a heel strike out there i recommend as best as possible shift your weight forward at least to the middle of the foot if not slightly to the forefoot caveat there you don't want to be high on the forefoot where you're squirrely where you're unbalanced or you risk the chance of falling but what we don't want to do is train ourselves to become a better heel striker so that's not going to serve us in the long run and we always would prefer to do a shorter stride that's less intense meaning less power with a shorter stride versus a longer stride with greater power the shorter stride is going to promote faster leg turnover when it comes to running, going to promote a faster, more efficient stride. The longer stride that you do in these cross-training activities will produce a slower, more slug-like stride come spring. So I want to recommend, there's always the latest, greatest machines coming out there. I can't keep on top of it. People always ask, well, what about the XYZ machine? Or have you tried out the, the GoFangle doodad? <laughs> and uh, unless you're in a gym 24-7 and unless you're checking out all of the gyms out there, it's hard to keep up with all of the fads and it's hard to keep up with all of the latest, greatest aerobic equipment that the gyms bring in today. The key on any of the machines is transition slowly every second to every third day max and start. I like to start machines with only a few minutes. So let's say I'm doing a stair stepper. I'll start ridiculously light. Maybe the first day I'll do three to a maximum of five minutes. I won't do it the next and then I'll increase by a minute every other day. Again, that sounds ridiculously light, but it gives me two huge benefits. One, you don't run the risk of an overuse injury. Two, it's fall, it's off season. It gives yourself a chance for everything to calm down. This is your calm down time before we rebuild extra strong. And then listen to your body. If you feel one of your knees is bothering you after you've been doing that stair stepper, after you've been doing that elliptical machine, then maybe skip that machine for the next few days, see if the pain goes away, and then reintroduce gradually. If the pain comes back, you may say, either I need to work on my form so that I'm not in pain, or I need to skip that machine. It's just not working for me. So listen carefully to your body. Now, what other gym equipment should you do, either at the gym or maybe you even have your home gym? And uh, I want to talk about lifting, strength training, the best thing in the world you can do wintertime. And for strength training, I recommend always starting with your largest muscle groups and working your way to your smallest muscle groups. And look for the exercises in the beginning that incorporate the most muscles to begin with. For instance, my favorite way to start is either with a hip sled, um, which you'll see in the image on the right, or a leg press. I don't actually have that on the images here. Your gym should have one, if not both of those. Those work your quads, your hamstrings, extremely work your glutes, and may actually work your calves a little bit as well. So it gets almost your entire leg. And then I recommend that you do one-legged exercises to begin. You could do a combination if you want for strength, do a little bit more two-legged than one-legged, but I would prefer one-legged exercises to begin because this is the time of year that we build balance or symmetry. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say that you can do a hip sled with 500 pounds. You know, you're pretty strong. You're a good sprinter. You're good at the mile. You can do 500 pounds on that. That's doing well. But if we break it down and have you do your left leg versus your right leg, your left leg, it turns out you can only do 200 pounds. Your right leg, you can do 300. Uh-oh. 
What that means is you're going to be running asymmetrically come springtime and you're looking into an overuse injury because you're not moving or using both of those legs evenly. So we want to get both of those legs in balance. So always one-legged exercises. I also recommend that you only go with leg exercises to a 90-degree bend, never beyond. A 90-degree bend is what you see on that image on the right. You'll see him stopping at a 90-degree bend between his lower leg and his upper leg. You don't want to go beyond that because you put excessive stress and strain on the knees, and you're never going to exceed that anyway when you run. Last thought on hip sleds or leg presses, you notice I'm not mentioning squats. Squats are a great exercise if properly coached with the right supervision. If not, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble really fast, particularly with the strong leg muscles that you get from running. So I recommend staying away from them unless you're going to be properly coached or supervised. Yes, key tip is always work from your largest muscle groups to your smallest. If you fatigue your small muscle groups first, you're really going to torch them when you go to the other machines. You're going to get an overuse injury from that. Lunges, fantastic exercise. You can do these both standing in place, and you can also do them walking around your gym as a walking lunge, switching from one side to the next. Trick is you want to go slow and controlled. You'll see a lot of people doing lunges where they get down about halfway, and then they go, Whoa and they collapse into the ground. Uh, you'll actually may even hear that knee dropping into the ground. That's a great way to get yourself injured or to tear muscle groups by just dropping down. And it misses the whole point, which is the slow and controlled lunge really helps build the soft tissue and the connective tissue that's going to keep you strong for the springtime. The whole goal here is not to see how many lunges you can do or how much weight you can do any exercise. It's to see how much we can make you of a more efficient, faster, and more injury-resistant runner come springtime. So do your lunges nice and slowly. And as you'll see her in position here, with that back nice and upright and erect, you do not want to be leaning forward. Hip machines. Getting those hips strong is huge. I cannot stress hip strength and hip flexibility enough. It's something we don't think about much with running because we're running in a straight line, so we think the hips are not an issue. Turns out to be the reverse. A large percentage of overuse injuries come from a weak hip so that our knees drop in, our knees turn out, our feet rotate in, our feet rotate out, or we get on uneven surfaces and we start swaying to the side, really stressing and straining our IT bands, among other things. So we want to work on strength. Two easy ways to the gym to do this are either doing it on a machine, and this shows an abductor and adductor machine here, or doing it with cable exercises, or even a stand upright exercise where you have this kind of pontoon in front of you that you swing in or you swing out. The one that exercise you see on the screen here, uh, this is my least favorite of the bunch because you cannot do it as a one-legged exercise. However, it is much better than doing nothing at all. This is my favorite. These are the cable exercises. These are the hardest because it's going to require the most uh, going slow and controlled. It also, this is awesome, it requires you to fully engage your core. Given the opportunity between a machine and a free weight, if you have the opportunity to do a free weight or cable exercise that allows you to engage your core and where it means that you have to hold everything in position or you're not going to be steady, go for that one because that's training your body on what to do when you're running. This is an example of an abduction and an adduction. You're going to want to do both of those. In fact, for all your exercises, you always want to work opposing muscle groups. So if you work your bicep, you work your tricep. If you work your quad, you work your hamstring as well. And if you work abduction or moving away from the body, you want to work your adduction or moving toward your body as well. So let's talk about leg curls and uh, leg extension and hamstring curls. Now, there are a lot of people out there that say you don't want to do leg curls, that it's not good for the knees. I'm going to disagree with that slightly as um, I, don't <laughs> I don't actually have a, um, 
uh, oh my gosh, an ACL, <laughs> excuse me, in my left knee. If you could see my left knee right now, I can move my kneecap around like a hockey puck. <laughs> and I've actually had a total of 10 knee operations on that knee uh, from injuries sustained earlier in life, and it is a miracle that I can keep running today. And one of the key reasons that I can keep running is leg extensions. Because what the leg extension does is it gets my quad strong to hold my knee in position. However, two key rules I've learned to follow with this, particularly because my knee may be considered more, maybe delicate than others, is one, starting slowly with very light weights so that I don't flame out my patellar tendon. That's the tendon below your kneecap that holds everything in place and that hinges. That's your hinge. The second thing is never to exceed 90 degrees. That's where I get in trouble. So I'm going to do it light. I'm not going to exceed 90 degrees to begin with. Highly recommend you do this as a one-legged exercise. It is extremely humbling to begin with. So on the left, you're going to see here a uh, leg extension. Oh, actually, I, I apologize. In this slide, we're just seeing the leg curl. So this is the hamstring one jumping a bit ahead of myself, this is where you pull your heel towards you, either seated or laying down. This one, I also don't want you to exceed 90 degree bend or you end up pulling your hamstrings. This is a very common injury that runners get when they go in the gym in the beginning. As they do the hamstring curls, they get real excited and those things are tight for a month or two to come. So start light. Next slide we'll jump into is the leg extension, which is you bring the leg out all the way in front of you to straight, you let it relax and come back. You bring it out all the way to straight, you let it relax and come back. You wanna alternate the leg extension and the leg curls. In fact, you can do a set of leg extension. If you got the other machine available, go do a set of leg curls, back to extension, back to leg curls. A last thought on the leg curls. In the previous slide, you saw one picture of somebody seated doing, and you saw a picture of a person laying down doing them. I like the laying down one if you can resist the tendency to arch the back and to try to pull in other muscle groups or to snap the weight. And no exercise should you be snapping the weight or really horking it up. You want to make it a very slow and gradual movement. So now we're taking a look at uh, single leg raises. We have a core series in our mindful running program and in all of our barefoot running programs where we can work on core strength while engaging, while doing uh, lateral strengthening exercises as well. Uh, this is a side leg raise here, which you can do laying down on your side, but you can also do it standing upright or on a balance disc or a balance ball. I highly prefer if you get the opportunity, do it standing upright. Snap your belly button into your spine, get your arms out to your side, lock them out to your side like wings, have an imaginary string pull you nice and tall to the sky, and then extend one leg out to the side, bring it back in, again out to the side, do for count of three, one, two, three, out, one, two, three, back, do for a set of 10, and then switch and do the other side. A quick note on calf raises here. Calf raises are a very overlooked exercise or activity for runners. I cannot recommend them enough. However, they're one that you're gonna wanna start into extra slowly. This is another time that runners tend to overdo it and flame out the calves really quickly. In fact, here we're seeing somebody doing it uh, with weights. I would say for the first month or two, you don't need to do it without weight or with weights at all. I would prefer instead that you do three position calf raises, which means you can do a set of 10, you drop down, come back up, drop down, come back up, and then one to the outside, drop down, come back up, drop down, come back out, and to the inside doing the same thing as well. If you'll note in this picture heel here, <laughs> getting ahead of myself, the heel is dropping beyond flat. It's like he's standing on a stair. That's what we want to get that full range of motion of the Achilles and of the calf. So do this on stairs, do this on a step, uh, do this on a low stool or even on a box. 
Uh, yes, key tip here, after you work one muscle group, always try to work the opposing muscle group as well. And now let's talk a little bit more about lifting safely. And I've worked with so many athletes on this. Uh, and oftentimes we're too over exuberant. We get into it. We want to do too much. And one of the things about running muscles is they'll lift a lot of weight to begin with. But the challenge is the connective tissue, the ligaments and tendons aren't ready for that. And so we can run into a lot of trouble very quickly. So to avoid that, the safest way to start is to start with only, only with 15 to 20 reps, but with silly light weight. What silly light weight? Silly light weight is so little weight that maybe you've got this tiny little dumbbell in your hand and you lift up and it's so light that you can almost throw that weight into the sky. Or you're doing a leg extension with so little weight on there that you kick up your legs and the weight wants to continue. That's just about the right weight. Now we wanna go slowly with this, a three count up and a three count down. Even more important to go slow on the down than the up. That's the eccentric part of the muscle contraction or what I like to call the essential part of the muscle contraction. Go every other day maximum. And because what happens when you're lifting weights is you're tearing things down and rebuilding them tearing things down and rebuilding them. If you don't do that, you tear them down, you tear them down some more, you tear them down some more, and now you're looking at hospital or downtime when we're trying to build you strong. So for these cycles, for the early parts of your lifting, every other day max, once we get into the really the strength or the power phase, then you can do once every third day if you want and really push those weights hard and then wait till you're fully recovered to go again. You can, however, if you're uh, addicted to the workout, if you really want to get the most out of the winter time, then you can, uh, you can do different muscle groups on different days. So one day you could do your legs and back. The next day you could do your upper body. Or it could be legs one day, upper body and back the next, and alternate back and forth. If you're going for once every third day, you could even do legs one day, back one day, upper body the next, and rotate through. There's nothing wrong with doing that as well. Now, I'm going to give you a, a very safe way to get into a program here, which is in the beginning, I want you to do day one, do one set of 15 to 20 reps. Don't do it the next. Day two, two sets, 15 to 20 uh, reps. Don't do it the next. Day three, three sets, 15 to 20 reps. Don't do it the next. And starting day four or starting that second week, now we can start to add weight. First, start adding weight just in your last set, then in two sets, then in three sets, and then add a beginning set that's just a warm-up set as well. Now, for your fourth set, as you get into this, let's say that you're doing... Uh, 10 pounds. <laughs> you're doing a leg extension. You're only doing 10 pounds. And on your fourth set, uh, 10 pounds, you get to 20 repetitions. It felt easy. You felt like you could do more. Then the next time you do it, you can bump up that last set to 15 or 20 pounds. It's always your last set that determines if I can increase weight or not. And then log your progress. This is the best and easiest way to know how you're doing, to keep yourself from getting injured, and to help you progress in the fastest and most efficient way. Now, I have a 90-day program for getting into serious strength. And uh, I participated in many sports in life. Uh, one of the sports I did was a, uh, a national class sprinter on the track in cycling. And I was a big boy. I was, <laughs> I was just over 200 pounds. I was, I was the guy you were scared of in the gym, which is hard to believe in my scarecrow-like frame right now. And what I had is a 90-day program that like dramatically increased my strength. Let's say I started in the gym at uh, 200 pounds on the hip sled. And within three months, I was pushing over 1,000 pounds. And the way I did that was by building my connective tissue and building my joints strong first. And for that, I have three 30-day cycles. If you want, you can extend them to 45-day cycles to get you into spring. If you're looking at weightlifting beyond that, let's say you were doing this all the way through uh, well six months from now, you could repeat 
two times those 90 day cycles. So it'd be first 30, 60, 90, then 30, 60, 90. First 30 days, this is high reps, 15 to 20 reps, like I mentioned before, a minimum of two to three seconds per repetition. Actually, I prefer three seconds up, three seconds down. The next cycle, this is your most important one. And this is the one that people cheat on the most. This one you want to do slow. I can't emphasize how slow of repetitions you want to do. Snails pace repetitions where you're going to go up one, two, three, four, five. Oh my God, does this burn? Six, <laughs> seven. It feels like my legs are going to fall off. Eight, <laughs> nine. 10, and then back it down at that same pace. Slow repetitions, only five to eight reps. You're gonna do this with really silly lightweight. Your body's gonna tell you what you're able to do. Obviously, start on the light side of things. Your muscles are gonna start trembling. They're gonna start shaking. You're gonna work up one heck of a sweat. What you're really doing here is building your connective tissue, your tendons, your ligaments, your soft tissue, building it incredibly strongly so that when we add on the strength, when we add on the um, gravity of running, you are going to be incredibly strong and more importantly, injury resistant. So take this next 30 days where you're going to go ridiculously slow, go even slower, and uh, hang in there for it because it's not an easy cycle. The next cycle, that's your reward. This is when you get to put up the big weight and have fun with it. Here we're going to do eight to 10 repetitions. Again, your last set, that third or fourth set, if you could do that 10 repetitions, bump it up the next time and you can focus on getting into some bigger weight. However, here it's form over function. What does that mean? It means we're looking at how clean and smooth and relatively slowly you can do these rather than how much weight you can throw up because throwing up a weight gets you injured. Going nice and smooth and controlled keeps you from getting injured. And that last 30 days, it's where now we've really built that soft tissue strong. Now we get into the joint building time as we add some serious weights in there, serious uh, resistance. So that does, first we're gonna work getting the tendons, ligaments strong. Then we're gonna work on building that entire joint strong and then, it's almost springtime and you're ready to fly. So now let's talk briefly about elasticity exercises. So in addition to getting you strong, we want to be able to give you a punch, to give you a snap, to be able to hop from rock to rock in the trails, to be able to accelerate on your runs. If you're playing on the track for you to be able to boom, take off if somebody's going, or if you're going to be the guy or gal who's going to be going for it as well. Now, the first note on elasticity exercises, because there's a lot more work on uh, your muscles and connective tissue involved, don't do these if you're recovering from any injury. So in general, I like to wait until you've been in the gym at least a good four to six weeks before you start getting into these, and then to test the waters slowly. How slowly? Grab a jump rope <laughs> and start jumping with only a couple inches rather than her who's uh, up a good six, eight inches, or maybe even uh, almost a foot that you can see on the screen. Start with that couple inches. Start with a minute or two. Add a minute every other time. Start to get into this. For those of you runners out there, like myself, who are not the most coordinated in the beginning, <laughs> first you can jump without the rope. Then you can put the rope next to you and start twirling it with the rope next to you. And then when you've got some nice and clean jumps with a sustained, steady rhythm, then get that rope going underneath you. And the heavier the rope, typically the easier it is to control. Jump roping's awesome. There's a reason you saw Rocky in the movies doing it. There's a reason so many people doing it uh, with any of the fighting arts and with so many other sports because it builds that snap. It builds that aerobic strength. It builds that ability to handle a frequent bouncing motion. And it does so many great things for us. You jump rope over the window. You can tremendously, you really feel that in your legs, legs once you're running come springtime. Now, most elasticity exercises, jump roping included, are what we call an ascent, ascent, <laughs> eccentric muscle contraction. 
What's an eccentric muscle contraction? Well, you ever run up a hill, it felt pretty easy, and then you started to go down the hill and your legs started to buckle, they're going wobble, wobble, wobble <laughs> beneath you? That's an eccentric muscle contraction. There's a braking motion going on in the muscles at the same time they're start trying to fire, or there's a lengthening of the muscles at the same time they're trying to shorten. This means that there's at least two to three times the work on the muscle of a normal muscle action or a normal muscle movement, or two to three times the force involved. Which means, even if you do a light workout today, a plyometric workout, a couple days from now, when you're feeling, oh, I should be ready to get going again, you could be tremendously sore, or what I call DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. It means you've broken down your connective tissue and you're going to have to wait longer to get started again. Why'd you get DOMS? because it's so much more of a workout than you think it is or than your body feels it is in the beginning. It's why we need to go extra slowly to start. So first we start with a jump rope, then we can look at some really fun exercises. I love box jumps, um, and uh, or what are often called a deep jump. Now, what a box jump is, is you can start on a shoe box, you can start on an actual box, and, um, like a wooden box that's a foot high, and you're gonna jump down off of these things. So basically, you've got a box here, you jump down, or you hop down off of it, you hit the ground, explode back up as fast as you can. Jump down, explode back up. Jump down, explode back up. It's that explosive motion of your body is decelerating, trying to catch itself as you land and hit the ground. At the same time, you're trying to repel or rebound yourself back up that's where you get so much more work that the muscles are doing, which means if you don't overdo it, so much more of a gain. It's why in the 80s and 90s, we had the Eastern Europeans, the Russians, the Germans, who were started on boxes and then are reported to literally jumped off of small rooftops to get that explosive motion going for the track sports once their ligaments, tendons, once their joints can handle it. A fun way you can do this in addition to just jumping off of a box is you can actually set up an obstacle course at your home or your gym and basically start hopping around the, at the place, typically in sets of 10, and then giving yourself a chance to recover. You can also do uh, upper body uh, plyometric work. I like taking a medicine ball and either throwing it to a partner, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. The goal is the second you catch and bring it in, you want to be throwing it back. You get it in, you throw it back. You get it in, you throw it back always with the core engaged. You can also do this on a wall. You're gonna to need to stay pretty close to the wall because a uh, medicine ball doesn't bounce very well. Just go split. <laughs> and you're gonna to need to throw with a good amount of force. So start with a lighter ball and just bounce, bounce, bounce. As soon as you get it in, throw it back. Uh, another exercise, eccentric muscle contraction exercise you can do is using a rebounder or trampoline. It's a very safe way to get into it. I have one in my house. I use it for uh, warming up before doing a stretching routine. If I can't get out because of, of rain or horrific conditions outside, um, and I'll go use the rebounder for a little bit. I've seen it used by people of all ages. Uh, our uh, best man at our wedding, he used to use one until the age of 91. And uh, just a few key rules to keep in mind on a rebounder or trampoline. One, don't land into the heels. I know it makes you bounce higher, but it also has you lock your knees, which is rule number two, don't lock your knees, because that jams your knees and causes uh, long-term challenges to your knees, to your hips, and your back. And the other thing is, don't just do the same hopping motion, bounce, 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 for minute after minute or almost hour after hour. Mix things up. Do one-legged bouncing. Do bouncing to the side. Go forward. Go back in all different angles and planes. Just make sure you're staying safely toward the center of the uh, trampoline or rebounder. And maybe put on some music. Put on some dance videos and really have fun playing on this thing. The more directions that you move on the rebounder or trampoline, the healthier it'll be for you. And then maybe every five or 10 minutes, take a 30 second break. It's not really a break, but stop jumping up and down and do a 30 second or a minute sprint on it, running in a running sprint motion. You won't really be getting the bounce out of it, but it, it really works your muscle groups in a unique way that pays big dividends for running on the roads, trails, or tracks later on. So here actually we have an image of the uh, box jump. You can see somebody's jumping down or hopping off of the box, 
They're landing, you can see about a 90 degree or just a little bit less of a bend in the knee. Again, we don't want to exceed that 90 degree bend and they're launching back up as fast and as quickly as they possibly can. And this just goes over things we talked about already, box jumps, obstacle courses, tossing the medicine ball, and you can see somebody running on a rebounder or trampoline, having a lot of fun, and uh, you can do a lot of one-legged work as well on it. Always try to keep that core engaged and keep the arms up. This is a great way to get the arms strong for your running come springtime as well.